Okay. Do I hit and continue by continuing? I'm consenting. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. So the video will be um, recorded. People can um, see it afterwards, but only the people that are in um, the meeting right now will get their CEUs. Okay. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> So a lot of people are filling in right now. We'll get started. We're going to give everyone one more minute. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's not 12 yet. Well. <laughs> <laughs> We're on time. <laughs> we are on time. That's that never right. happens. Like when you start <laughs> right on point. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so we'll give everyone a couple minutes and we're pretty much going to get rolling um, to make sure there's enough time for mm -hmm. question and answers. So welcome everyone. I love this picture. Thank you. I, I, I thought this would be good too, to see the various faces. Yeah. You know, we're not just one, you know, African descent is very Definitely. And, diver and diverse, right? Absolutely. When you were talking to me earlier, Roxana, that's why I wasn't there. I was like looking at all the faces. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> that's great, Nia. <laughs> so it got my attention. Yes. <laughs> and this is a topic we're going to bring back in August. Um, right. So stay tuned, yeah. everyone on the line, not only for the providers, but for the everyday person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that we want to really um, give attention to the topic of gambling in the Black community. Um, mm -hmm. I know this is a topic that's new for me, not not so much Dr. Haskins. <laughs> 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 so thank you um, for joining us. Give one more minute. Okay. Because we still have people um, logging in. So thank you guys okay. for this mm -hmm. taking time to do this lunch and learn with us. And I'm going to uh, send you all the slides so that you can share them. Um, I don't know if you want to put it on your website. So just feel free. Okay. Thank how, you. However, however you want to share it, um, particularly because people are visual learners. And so all, oftentimes they may need the, you know, just the information so that they can refer back. And I also have resources at the end. Awesome. We love mm -hmm. the resources. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think we're going to go ahead and get started because we want to make sure we okay. have enough time. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for mm -hmm. coming to Problem Gambling and the Black Community. Who says it's a problem? Mm -hmm. We say mm -hmm. it's a problem sometimes, <laughs> depending. Yes. And Dr. Deborah Haskins is going to be mm -hmm. reviewing with us a cultural review of problem gambling for clinicians. Mm -hmm. For this uh, training, we have one CEU. The only thing with it, you have to fill out the survey. Mm -hmm. It's a free CEU for you. Um, and at the end of the Zoom, mm -hmm. that survey is going to populate. So you don't even have to go anywhere. I will share it in the chat as well, but make sure you fill that out. And mm -hmm. for today, we have Dr. Deborah Haskins. She's mm -hmm. a national and international gambling disorders leader. Mm -hmm. She is a practitioner with close to 25 years of experience supporting African descent communities, including the U.S., Bermuda, Nova Scotia. I didn't even know there was Black people in Nova Scotia, so that's pretty awesome. And close to 30 years focusing on community wellness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Haskins, for joining us today and presenting this information for us. You're welcome. It is an honor for me. I have long admired and respected the Black Mental Health Alliance. So thank you for the great work that you're going to do. And we're going to get started. Now, hold on to your seats, everybody, because this is a fast and furious um, knowledge. And I'm an educator. I'm a counselor educator, retired, um, but I'm still an educator. And so hold on to your seats. Uh, you will have access to the slides um, uh, at some point, the Black Mental Health Alliance will share them with you. And I'm including a lot of resources at the end, but I want to give you some time at the end. So I'm going to present for like 45 minutes and leave the last 15 minutes for 
Q&A. And, uh, and so let's go ahead and get moving. So the objectives really quickly today is to give you an introduction to what I identify as the oxymoron of African descent problem gambling, who says it's a problem, to explore, explore very briefly some prevalence research and what are the motivations to gamble among African descent communities. We have to understand why are they motivated to gamble to identify the criteria for disorder gambling or gambling disorder. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with that because there is some resource, are some resources in the state for you to get more clinical training, um, specifically to go deeper so that you understand it, to discuss Afrocentric and cultural values in an approach as well as an application to some illustrative gambling and mental health cases. So I've identified three cases I hope we'll have time for, um, and that way you can understand how to apply this cultural approach from an African-centered uh, understanding. And then lastly, I'm going to provide some ideas for you to review creative gambling and mental health wellness ideas in a COVID-19 to uh, COVID and post-COVID world. All right, so here we go. So the first one, we're not gonna actually do the poll, but I want you to just think about this for yourself. Are you familiar with the criteria of gambling disorder and problem gambling? Yes or no? So everybody has to do your own assessment. If you know that you're not that familiar, I want you to make some arrangements and a professional development plan so that you can get more knowledge and skills so that you are equipped to provide support um, for our community. Because you'll see that sports betting is here. It's coming fast. And we also have a lot of internet gaming that's going on and uh, social media is also used for people to play gaming. So there's so much that is accessible right now and available. And it means that all of us, even if we weren't interested in supporting gaming disorder or high-risk gambling or high-risk gaming, we've got to get familiar. Um, and so I wanna encourage you to do what you can to do that. I wanna get started first by saying, let's, first of all, let's identify who is African descent. And many of you are already familiar with this, so I'm not going to really be teaching you probably anything that that's new, um, because you are Black Mental Health Alliance um, sort of people interested in Black mental health. And so if you are, you're probably familiar to this statistic. We have over 200 million people who actually identify themselves as being African descent and actually live in the Americas. What's really important that many of you are already familiar with is that whether they are descendants of the victims of the transatlantic um, slave trade, or if they recently immigrated or migrated from the continent of Africa or the diaspora, which includes the West Indies, but can include even, uh, you know, uh, other parts that we aren't even that familiar. The bottom line is that many persons of African descent have limited access, to, as we know, to housing, to education, to quality health care, and to social security. And we remain largely invisible. That's why I do the work that I do, and you are doing the work you're doing. Because the reality is that, unfortunately, in our training world, if you are a clinician, if you have gone through psychological training or social work training or health training in some way, or even prevention training, unfortunately, the paradigms that we have been taught have not been inclusive and it has not included our voices. And so we still remain largely invisible. And that's why I've been presenting on this topic for the last 25 years, because when I entered the profession, in 1991 and was trained during my doctoral internship, I knew that many people in my community were not going to run to therapy. And I can count on two hands, honestly, in my whole career, I can count on two hands how many African descent people I have provided gambling treatment for. And what does that suggest? That suggests that we have a huge need in our community, but we know that there's huge issues why people don't want to participate in mental health. And I'm going to highlight that, and I probably won't need to because many of you are already knowledgeable about that. 
So why the title problem gambling, who says it's a problem as an African descent? I started using this title because I thought problem gambling is a tagline, but it, it's also an oxymoron. And what is an oxymoron? An oxymoron is defined as putting two contradictory words together. And so problem and gambling, that's the oxymoron. But the reality is that problem and gambling is contradictory for African descent people, as well as other cultural communities. And why? Because many humans, including African descent communities, do not see gambling as the problem. They see gambling as the solution. And why do they see gambling as the solution? They see gambling as the solution, the solution to un unemployment, the solution to underemployment, solution to social injustice, the solution to emotional distress, racial discrimination, police brutality, financial distress, access to food, housing, security, immigration, and acculturation challenges. And so that's why this whole term, even in how we brand it and our marketing, we will not reach the people in our community that we need to reach. So let's look very briefly at what are the criteria. And if you're interested, you can sign up for clinical training with the Maryland Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling, which is part of the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Behavioral Health Administration. This is in the DSM-5, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but this is the criteria that you would need to get trained on. So for example, is the person gambling with increasing amounts of money in order to achieve their desired effect. They're spending more money on lottery tickets. They're spending more money when they go to the casino games. They run through their rent. They run through their mortgage. They're like the young lady who called me for help as an African descent woman who said, my boyfriend who I live with has a gambling problem, I think, he told me he was going to McDonald's. He asked me if I wanted any food and I haven't seen him in 10 hours. I know that he is not at McDonald's in 10 hours because the MGM casino is right down the street. So, you know, these are some of the realities of the people that are calling for help. Does the person become more restless and irritable? If they're not able to get to the game or they don't get access to the, the money, or as my gambler who gambles on the way to work because he feels oppressed as a black man in a company that he still hasn't been promoted. And so going to work is a trigger. So these are some of the criteria and I'm gonna encourage you to get more training. So let's just start with some of the prevalence realities. How prevalent is gambling disorder or high risk gambling among African descent? What we see in the research, and we know that research is not inclusive still because to date, we still don't have a book or resource to help, resource to help many of us provide clinical services to people of color and culturally diverse individuals and families and communities, including African descent. I'm actually gonna work on writing such a book. But in the meantime, this is what we know. African-Americans represent the largest minority group with gambling disorder. And it's significantly higher when you look at the rates compared to European descent members. And so what else do we know? Let's take a look at some other research. This is one from 2018 where they looked at studies from the US, UK, and Canada. And they see a relationship between gambling, high-risk gambling, and poverty. No surprise. Here are some of the following populations that we see as risk. We see people who are members of indigenous cultures, people who experience complex needs. If there's a liquor store in every corner, it's no surprise that there's higher rates of substance abuse. Why is that so hard for the politicians and others to understand? That there's an over density of liquor stores in the Black community. So no surprise. We see more challenges with older adults because they're isolated. They don't have the same access to networks as they get older and they have more health challenges. Males, under, under unemployed, people with low income, 
African-American, young adults are gambling more and more and they're gaming more and more because it's socially accessible and it's accessible. We also see research that was done by Dr. Sylvia Martins, a public health uh, researcher and scholar who started at Johns Hopkins here in Baltimore. And she did a longitudinal study of African-American youth. And what did she find? She followed them from grades two all the way up till they were 23 years old approximately. And guess what? No surprise, the African descent youth who lived in disadvantaged communities, communities with poor housing, high lead um, issues, poor access to transportation, not having um, proper food and equity and food uh, opportunities, uh, not having access to jobs, no surprise that those African American youths then develop substance abuse issues as well as gambling. Um, and we see veterans as well. And I've already mentioned homelessness. So I want to start with a YouTube that uh, Roxana is going to uh, share with us the first two minutes I want you all to listen to. This is a resource for you to listen and learn. It's a very short YouTube. If you're doing psychoeducation in the African and Black communities, I would encourage you to show this YouTube to your clients. If you're doing community wellness, you could show this and you could have an open discussion, perhaps on Facebook Live. So let's just listen to the first two minutes. Can you hear it? Yes. Oh, well, thank we've you. We've already been seeing some of the negatives as uh, effects of gambling in our neighborhood and communities. We know a lot of people go down there and they spend money in the, in the um, uh, in these gambling houses, and of course they get very little, if any, benefit from them at all. I didn't want to die. And I thought I was going to die. I thought I was, I, I, I really was trying to kill myself. Well, the mindset that they have is they just know they're going to win. This story about the gambling addictions and the effect it's having on black people and especially black women has to be told. Jackpot. The social and legal implications of gambling in the black community. This film discusses a subject that is taboo in the black community, problem gambling. This is an issue that reaches into people's homes, churches, and jobs, but its effects are rarely discussed. Gambling has caused great heartache in families and communities. Some have lost their homes, some have fractured important relationships, and others have even taken their lives, and yet their story is rarely told. This documentary speaks to those who are struggling with this problem, but do not have a voice. The black community has a long history with gambling, from numbers running, spades, bingo in churches, to casinos and the lottery. We know that um, uh, certain cultures, such as African Americans and, and uh, even the Chinese and Asian community, um, tend to have a predilection for uh, participating in gambling. And maybe it is part of our long-term culture because what we would call small games of, ch of chance in our neighborhoods. You know, we, we, we knew who ran the numbers in the neighborhood. Uh, and, and we knew that, uh, you know, at the card table and, and those kinds of places, you know, bets were being placed and going on. But that was small-time stuff. And normally, you, didn't, you weren't betting that much to get in trouble. Another characteristic that may uh, make an ethnic member more susceptible to gambling is if culturally that particular community um, has gambling as a part of its normal activity, behavior, the way they fellowship, um, the way they um, just participate in life. For example, in some communities, um, card playing is uh, uh, just something that families do every Friday night or Saturday night, they play pinochle or back rack or 
or speed. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it's more or in, in black community or less in the black community. It is one of the things that is part of the black community as it seems to be in all our communities. Many of the traditional forms of gambling in the black community have been replaced by casinos. The following three people were with I think you wanted me to stop, but you're on mute. <laughs> All right, so I'll share a screen again. All right, thank you, Roxana. Oops, hold on, let me get the other one. Here we go, hold on, great. So this is a resource for you all. It, it's more and it's very in interesting. At the end, you'll see a young lady who shares her experience as the daughter of a mother who has a gambling addiction. And I think that would be a good um, watch so that you can get the perspective of how gambling affects the family members. But I do want to note, um, as an affiliate, that that clip was taken when I was at Loyola. I was there for 16 years. The YouTube was produced by four African uh, descent law students at University of Penn who were taking advocacy against the proliferation of gambling in the Black community um, in the Philadelphia um, when they built the casinos. And so um, as a member of, I'm the president of the Maryland Council on Problem Gambling, we maintain a neutral stance. We're not pro or against gambling. We want there to be greater public awareness. We wanna provide advocacy and assistance um, as well as research. But in the YouTube, you just have to be aware that there is not a neutral st uh, stant stance. And so you have to be prepared for that. And I always have to give that um, sort of so the uh, caveat. So let me just share with you some other important scholarship that's being done. The Massachusetts Public Health Focus um, Group also identified, I'm going to be talking about what are the motivations. So when you're working with a person who is African descent and you have an opportunity, you want to find out why are they motivated to gam gambling? They didn't just start gambling um, and, and develop a gambling addiction um, in one day. What's motivating them? And try to get deeper. Um, this is a really interesting study. They did, uh, they did five focus groups with 49 people, and this is what they found. They found that life context was a significant theme, that many of the participants uh, shared that they lived a life that included impover impoverishedness, lacking employment opportunities, they also needed social services in their communities that they didn't have access to. They also identified the theme of overall gambling experience and problem gambling, identifying having financial needs. They enjoyed the recreation. They also enjoyed thrill seeking. So for example, many of you will remember Bruno Mars um, song, 24 Karat Gold. If you haven't watched that lately, watch that. And when you watch it, you'll see why the lore? Because Bruno Mars is singing, basically, be the big man, come here, and it's 24 karat gold. You have access to women, money, good times. I mean, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun in the song, but it really highlights what's going on also in the community. African Americans may also gamble um, because of religious beliefs. And now, this was another theme that this study found that religious beliefs had a, an important role. People pray to God to help them win, but they also pray to God to help them cope with the pro problem gambling. And so that's, you know, kind of an oxymoron too, if you, if you think. Um, I had a client who was African-American, sang on the choir, and she admitted um, she actually embezzled funds from her manager's fund to stay in the game long because she was a good employee, they sent her to treatment and, and paid for it, but that was a requirement. You need to get this addressed. Um, but she admitted in therapy that she used to write down the scriptures because she would go after service to play the number. So people are playing the number and gambling, whether they are Christian, whether they are um, from a non-Christian identity and maybe another spiritual identity, it doesn't matter, people are accessing this. So that was an important theme. They also noticed that they played the lottery and why? The lottery is uh, of interest because it's really low cost. You can be in the game and not have to spend a lot of money. Um, and then they also identified the negative consequences that resulted as a result of the gambling, homelessness, 
um, mental health issues, uh, uh, depression. We have a high rate of suicide attempts and com um, completion as well, but a lot of people even have passive suicidal thinking. And they actually believe that if they're not here, that their family would be better and they'll be better off because they actually feel like they have no control over the despair that has happened as a result of their high risk gambling. And they feel like uh, killing themselves and taking their life will be better for them to end the pain, but also be better for their family who they feel a lot of shame and guilt about. So these are also some of the motivations that we see. And so the participants I mentioned highlighted the need of mental health services in their community. And this is where we have to do better. The reality is that people should not have to travel far to get to help. Just think about it. If you are living in a life where you're struggling, you don't have money to get to work, you don't have money to eat, how likely is it that you're going to be able to take the limited resources or non-existent resources to get to a therapy session? That's just not even realistic. And so we've got to think about this so that we can make uh, the services accessible. This is one of the positives I see from COVID. I'm not happy that COVID happened, but guess what? The good news of COVID-19 is that it has increased uh, access to opportunities for care. People can get telehealth if they have a smartphone. Unfortunately, we know that people in the Black community, still there's a gap and there's a disparity. So it's still problematic, even with accessible telehealth. But the fact of the matter is that we've got to provide more access. So the remedies have to be multifaceted. We can't just focus on the diagnostic criteria and I'm gonna talk about the Afrocentric values next because the diagnostic cr criteria has not been developed for African descent persons. Um, and it's important for us to understand the diagnostic criteria, but we know that the DSM is a disease model that is problematic for people of African descent. And I'm gonna talk about that next because when you're working with your gambler, you wanna ask them this question. What is attractive to you about the gambling? Why do you gamble? Is it to enjoy entertainment? Are you connecting to your family, friends? Do you, are you using it to supplement your income? As my gambler told me, when his wife didn't return to work after the birth of her, their child, because they were, she was afraid that someone was going to sexually abuse her child because of her own experience. So he started gambling as a financial strategy. It's also to relieve emotional distress when people are feeling down and out, they're feeling sad, they're feeling anxiety. We have older adults who are experiencing spouse loss or partner loss or children loss or feeling isolated in their homes, um, particularly through COVID. And so they may gamble with their phones more or with their devices. We actually are seeing more women who are gambling with their devices or gaming with their device because women tend to have greater roles of caregiving. And so they don't have the opportunities to get to the venues similar to how men may. And so they may be using these devices. But the bottom line is we have to understand that people gamble in the black community to have hope. Because if they believe that I can't achieve the American dream due to systemic racism, lack of equality, structural barriers, and to escape social injustices, guess what? They're gonna gamble because they believe I would rather take my chance on this number or this casino game or this gaming game or this you know, poker game or this roulette, whatever it is, than to count on an institution and on a world that has never been for me, has never looked out for my people, and, I'm, and I've already struggled, what's another struggle? I'm already struggling, what's another struggle? And so what I say is when I drive around Baltimore City, I see people doing group therapy in their own community. What do I mean by that? 
They're hanging out with their neighbors. They're talking to their neighbors. They're building each other up. They're sharing their, their struggle. They're talking about what they're frustrated by. They're giving each other hope and encouragement. They're even giving each other suggestions. Hey man, do this or do that or go here or sister, you know, but they're working it out in their own way. And we don't even know enough about what people may be doing to self-manage and what people are doing that, that they're not managing well. But we've got to become more invested in what I think this next slide is going to talk about using a health equity lens. And so we don't have time to open this up, but I want to in encourage you to um, read this scholarship that one of my colleagues, um, the great Victor uh, Ortez is the director of the Massachusetts Public Health uh, Division on problem gambling. And they did an amazing project called Our Voices Matter, using lived experience to promote equity in problem gambling. And what did they do? They recognized that regular people like you and me or I might not be so regular because I have a PhD, but people who don't have our clinical expertise, just normal people like people in my family or people in your family who are breathing through life challenges, substance abuse, struggle, joblessness, poverty, or maybe opportunities have increased, but they still don't have the the, the necessary supports compared to European descent persons. And so what they did is they made them ambassadors and trained them in problem gambling. Was healthy gambling, was problem gambling. And they got these people to go out into the community, similar to like the safe, um, you know, uh, the trying to work with the gangs and, and getting them to use conflict management skills instead of guns um, is a similar concept and paradigm. So they've reached 4,000 community members. Isn't that amazing? We will never reach as clinicians 4,000 community people who are hurting. We will never be able to reach those numbers. But if we can get creative and do community wellness that recognizes that people who are ordinary have lived experiences and we can equip them to understanding some of this information so they know who to call for help or who to bridge their brother and sister or cousin or mother or granny or auntie or uncle or extended family member to get these persons to help. Okay, so this is a resource. Here's another resource. Know thyself use an anti-racist approach to achieving health, mental health equity in clinical care. And so this is another resource that you can download and learn as a clinician, how can we use an anti-racist approach? Even as a person of African descent, we are victims of racism and internalized racism too. Okay, and so we have to also look at the ways that we are miseducated about people who are African descent. Um, and so this is a good resource for you. All right, let's keep going. These are just some reflection questions that I'm not going to take time to read through because you all are super bright, but these basically get you to reflect. This is from a book chapter that I wrote, African Americans and Psychotherapy. Um, that was published in a clinician's guide focusing on self-renewal. And so before I even talk about how to provide psychotherapy to Blacks and African descent persons, I said, we have to look at our own perceptions about how we view people of African descent. What are the ways that we have allowed the media and education to distort our beliefs, our thoughts, our understandings, our perspectives about people in our own communities. So these are just some reflections. Also recognizing that we have great diversity in our community. So next I'm gonna look briefly at what's some knowledge that you can use. And now we're moving into Afrocentric values and then the skills. I'm not gonna take so much time because I think that many of you are familiar with Afrocentric values, but just in case you aren't, 
take some time to look at this. Afrocentric values, if you remember from your reading and from your education, if you have done this on your own, because obviously we have not been exposed to Afrocentrism in our school systems and in our training programs. You have to, and I had to read outside uh, of these, you know, universal Eurocentric, uh, what is promoted as universal to learn about our history. But we know that throughout most of history, the observations about African-American behavior or African descent behavior was using as a reference point and a model, the European American as the model of normality. And so what happened is that these standards of observation led to the conclusion that we had social pathology because we didn't behave like the European descent, um, descent person. And we know that that's a, all wrong because the reality is that that's a distortion. We have our own cosmology. And so Ab, Ab, um, Dr. Akbar talks about this in 19, I'm sorry, in 2004. He says the logical fallacy in this is that an inappropriate attribution of normative statements about non-white people is the assumption that to be intelligent or healthy means you have to act like a European rather than as an agent of your own culture. So this is really important. These cultural values, similar to what the Black Mental Health Alliance is doing always in your work, what's important for us to highlight is the Afrocentric focus is the position that race is the critical human issue in the study of African-American behavior. If we don't understand the influence of race and racial uh, and white supremacy and how that has impacted people of, of, of African descent or people who are black, then we are missing the boat. The essential value of the African psychological system, as we understand, is the centrality of the human being. The human being is what's important, not the object. And how we conceptualize self is this. Self, as we know, not telling you anything new because you all could do this session yourself, um, this teaching, conceptualizes self as an unqualified collective phenomenon. I am because we are, as Dr. Mabiti said, and because we are, therefore I am. So whatever happened to me, the gambler, is affecting the corporate body, the tribe, my whole community. The collective consciousness or experiential communality is really what's important. So when we saw George Floyd murdered, Breonna Taylor, all of the, the boys and girls that have been taken from this world without in, in, a, in, in, a, in a traumatic and unjust way and in a violent way. That was my brother, my sister, my child. And I actually have a picture of Breonna Taylor hanging in my, in my house because Breonna Taylor is my daughter and that's the African centered focus. So let's take a quick look at how do we view time? African time is cyclical and the major value, no surprise, we already know this, I already know I'm preaching to the choir, is survival. The goal when you're working with your gambler of African descent is to understand the current behaviors and understand the history of racism, how that has impacted them in the current day and contemporary oppressions that they experience. So when my black male gambler is talking about how he feels oppressed as a black man and how invisible he is, not just in the large world, but also in his job, but also he feels invisible to God. And he's saying, God, what's up? Where are you? And he's also feeling invisible in his relationship with his wife. And so he has these multiple layers of disconnection. Um, and so this, this slide just talks about some of the central values again. Um, and I want to give you as a resource, Kelly 2019, if you wanna look at a model of treatment 
CBT as a theoretical model does show the best outcomes. We don't have evidence-based treatment looking at Afrocentric theory, but what we have to do, and many of you are doing hopefully, is integrating Afrocentric practice with these other theoretical models, okay? And I have had really good success when I do that. This next scholarship looks at four classes of variables that are important when you look at the psychological functioning of any black individual, client. What are their reactions to racial oppression? What is the influence of the majority culture on their, on their self, on their family, on their tribe? What is the influence of the traditional African-American culture? Are, there, are they attached to those practices or are they disconnected? Because as a therapist, I'm gonna reconnect my black client with their permission using an Afrocentric approach to our traditional cultural values that honor spirit at the center, family, my connectedness with the community, okay? Not just this focus on self, individual psychology. And I'm also gonna look at what are the strengths that this gambler has. So my client, he was a mentor on his job to a lot of black young brothers on the job who didn't have fathers in their life. And I said, good for you. Look at all you're doing to raise up these black men, making them stronger, making them bolder, making them more secure. That counts for a lot. Even if he never went to a GA meeting, his wife said, I'm upset that you didn't go into the Gamblers Anonymous meeting. You drove there, but you never opened the door. Guess what I said? I'm gonna focus on his endowment, his strength. I said, good for you. Guess what? You got on the parking lot. I think one day you might open the door, but then again, maybe you won't, but you're doing all these other things well. And so that's what I'm gonna, enhance more about. We also know that those variables kind of influence one another. And then this is an update that I wanted to share that I really love when I saw this. This is something that just came out um, in 2020 by Drs. French and other scholarships. Many of them are African descent. And they basically used an uh, integrated framework approach that included a form of healing, looking at radical healing, transformation using liberation psychology, black psychology, ethno-political psychology, and intersectionality, which if you if you might remember, intersectionality was developed by a black woman scholar who saw feminism as not being inclusive of black women and developed the intersectionality model that included the multiple identities that people of African descent and other people of color experience, but also uh, acknowledges social justice. And so radical healing in this model talks about being able to sit in the dialectic and exist in both spaces while you resist oppression and move towards freedom. And how do we do that? And this is gonna get me to the cases and we're gonna have an opportunity for a QA. You see a lot of this, I'm not gonna take time because you'll be able to read this, but you'll see emotional and social support. But what does this mean? We wanna raise your client's critical consciousness, more critically reflect as this black gambler that I'm working to support to look at the sociopolitical environment that he's living and breathing through and to say, guess what? You are surviving a system that wasn't designed for black people. And let's look at how we can equip you for the struggle, for the fight. Our people have gone through slavery and modern day slavery and oppression. I wanna give my client radical hope and envision possibilities. Hope is a necessary condition to improve one existence. The, the, the slaves and the abolitionists, they all understood that, that we have to have a sense of agency to change things and to believe in the greater good. That's why we keep fighting for justice and that the fight won't be futile. Let's look at to foster radical hope, strength and resilience, strength to resist the oppression. Let's 
increase their cultural authenticity and self-knowledge. Let's return them back to the ancestral roots that many of them don't even know about. Let's give them some quotes and read in the session from some of the literature that educates them. Let's give them podcasts that are Afrocentric, that helps them to breathe in between the, sen the sessions if they're coming for therapy. And let's get them more connected to the broader community. These are some of the updates. Many of us are already using testimony in our sessions with clients. And what is that? We create a safe space for them to share their testimony where we don't judge them. We tell them, you count, you count, I hear you, I hear you. And we also want to create more opportunities for community healing. There's so much that we can do. So this gets me into the last two minutes before the Q&A. How, what does it all mean? Let's lastly look at skills and let's look very quickly at two, three vignettes. I'm going to do this really quickly. You'll be able to watch this and read this after the session is over, right? The training. Ahmed, in summary, is a 35-year-old African-American cisgender male who has lived through two cancer treatments in his 20s. Ahmed is married, has a 14-year-old son. He's on disability. He doesn't work because of his uh, severe chronic health conditions. He's a pancreatic cancer survivor. And for him, gambling is offering him a sense of connectedness spiritually. That's the way he's seeing it. I feel connected. It's really a spiritual. It's like the soul behind the high. He says, I'm not a man. How can I teach my, man, my son manhood when I can't even contribute to my home? And so a cousin actually calls for help for her dear cousin. How would I use an Afrocentric approach with Ahmed? I would recognize that here is an African-American male who experiences invisibility every day. He steps out into the world that doesn't validate his existence. Race will be discussed right from the start. What were the conditions also that set him up as a health high risk? Having adverse childhood experiences in his community set him up to have these future chronic health conditions. But I'm going to use an integrated Afrocentric approach that would begin on encouraging his testimony of his lived experiences as a Black man versus focusing on the gambling only. An empowerment approach that collaborates with him and asks him, Ahmed, what do you want to achieve? And how can I partner with you to get the, to the outcome? Gambling counseling will help him also see how through uh, the Afro-centered, African-centered values, he can begin to transmit manhood, getting him to look at rites of passages that he can start to set up a healthier um, present that even though we may not focus too much on the future, but we can look at the past to the present and help him be able to deliver more freedom and more healing for him, his wife, and his family and community. All right, so I'm going to pause here because we're at quarter of, and I have a couple of other cases. I'm going to ask um, Nia and Roxana to come in because I have an older adult case and I have also a college student case, but I'm okay if you all don't, we don't get to these cases because I'd rather have some opportunity for the QA. And you'll be able to see, I present you the case and then I also give you what the Afro Center approach is. And then if we can just take a few minutes um, at the end so that I can show them some of the resources that I wanna highlight for them. These are some examples of community wellness while they bring uh, these, these are some state resources, the Center of Excellence, the Maryland Council of Problem Gambling, the Gamblers Anonymous, the Voluntary Exclusion Program. If you want a gambler wants to remove themselves legally from going into a casino or playing the lottery. And then I also share some of the work that I've been doing in the Mer Maryland Council on Problem Gambling to do community wellness. And um, this is a, the 30 minute psychoeducation that I did um, with the DC public um, TV over for the UDC. And you can use this um, in your work 
feel free to show it. It's basically a 30 minute education where I explain um, gambling disorder and the host is asking me questions. <coughs> Sorry, so I'll pause here and we'll have some questions and answers. No problem, Dr. Haskins. I just put in the chat, does anyone have any questions? Do you okay. want to do one more uh, case study? Okay, so we do have a question here. Okay. Um, excellent presentation. How do we get, you. get youth in particular to recognize when their gambling becomes problematic? That's a good question. Okay, very good question. Um, and what I recommend, if you're gonna work with youth, I would recommend developing um, a strength focus, um, maybe quick session, maybe 15 minute. Um, I would encourage therapists, if you're not comfortable with Facebook Live, find somebody who is, where um, you can get a 15 minute, just to keep their attention really short, no more than maybe even 10 minutes. And I would do like a 10 minute session on what are the positives of gaming? What are the positives of um, of gambling, you know, there are positives. It's not all bad. There are actually some benefits. It increases your cognitive um, skills. It increases your ability to problem solve. It provides you opportunities to connect with your peers. Um, it, there's a lot of positive benefits. I would recommend you brand it that way. And then you share um, information about what happens when people that sometimes people start out um, doing it really for fun, and then the fun can then turn into something else, and then say, okay, if you notice this, this is what you want to do. Um, a good resource, I'm actually in my office right now, and there's a resource that I want to show you all called Pause and Reset. Pause and Reset. If you Google this, this is a book it's a parent's guide to preventing and overcoming problems with gaming. And it's a good resource. It's really written for parents and caregivers, but it would be a good resource for you because it gives you like a checklist and it gives you the content information that you need. You can also contact the Maryland Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling and you can get access to handouts. Um, they have a lot of great resources that they can send you virtually. You can send an email to our uh, Maryland Council on Problem Gambling, and we will also get you access to handouts, materials that you can use. The Maryland Center of Excellence actually has youth um, training um, in their archives, and so you can get access to that as well. Um, but I want to say this, branded in positivity, branded in positivity, talk about the strengths, Maybe do something on preparing for, for um, post high school um, or preparing for college, preparing for Vogue Tech. And when you're doing that, talk about these are the ways you want to prepare, but these are some of the issues that come up for people who are able to transition to the post high school experience well. If they experience, um, they get uh, um, caught up in marijuana use drinking, um, you know, other risky behavior, community um, gangs, then so I would brand it in a positive way, brand it in African centered uh, values, and then provide it's sort of like what I learned, I used to work for a lawyer years before my first profession. Uh, what lawyers do is they do a lot of looping, they will find a loop somehow right? <laughs> they will find it. I think as clinicians, we've got to loop more. We got to loop more. We've got to loop more. And so, you know, I developed um, two presentations recently for the Black Baltimore Washington United Methodist Church, which I'm a member of. Um, and, uh, and so I had Anthony Parente, who is a European descent uh, gambling counselor and amazing colleague um, and leader in the field, gambling disorder leader in the field here in Maryland. Uh, and I had Anthony do a session on men's health. And then I had Kevin Mason, who's an African-American, amazing leader who works, um, who's the director of um, My Brother's Keeper, Catholic Charities. He's going to do one, see me, I title it, I am here, 
men of color mental health. So I think that it's just the goal is try to do things on positive coping skills. And while you're at it, then loop in the information. Because if you brand it in negativity and in a disease model way, they will not come. Because why? We have been beat down so long. We have been pathologized for, for centuries that why am I gonna attend a session on gambling disorder? I don't wanna have a gambling disorder. Nobody wants to recognize that they have a disorder. They don't wanna recognize that they're depressed. The grandmother used to say, rest your nerves. She didn't say I'm clinically depressed. She would say, just go rest your nerves, okay? When cousin Lily would have schizophrenia and had to go to be institutionalized when she had a, a psychotic break, okay? They didn't, nobody talked about it. They, she just went away quietly and then she came back. Nobody really wants to talk about the disorderness or the pathology and why? Because it's a model that has really not done well for people in our community. You know, and so let me give you an example. When we went to Park Heights Avenue to educate 20 businesses, small business owners about problem gambling, guess what? We were intentional. We did not use any of the posters. The Maryland Center of Excellence has wonderful outreach communications. We didn't use any of the flyers that said gambling disorder because we wanted to just give them the information about the 1-800-GAMBLER helpline call for help without seeing the pathology branded. So I, I hope that helps. Um, and I kind of went beyond the question, but I hope that's helpful. I think that is helpful because it gives um, somewhere, especially for young people um, mm -hmm. to get their attention. So you have three more questions. Hopefully. Okay. At the room. Are you seeing more harm reduction approaches incorporated into prevention? Absolutely. And so um, I would say even 15 years ago, and maybe even 10 years ago, we as a field of gambling disorder and problem gambling and gambling field, gambling wellness, we really didn't feel comfortable with harm reduction um, because gambling treatment um, emphasize the abstinence model. But what has happened over time is because there's such a high level of ambivalence among gamblers, because they see that there's benefits, they don't see a way out in other ways, they do feel that there's some benefits for them. Um, and so they want to stay, they want to stay in the game, but also particularly in the black community, because they don't see a way out um, structurally and systemically, so they stay in the game even longer. And so what we started to do more of is work with the ambivalence using motivational interviewing approaches and asking the gambler. Like there was one person who he wasn't even a client, but he was a custodian. And he was sharing with me that he was gambling $200 a week. Um, and he was also in recovery for substance abuse. And so I just started having conversations with him and say, let's talk about how you can reduce how much money you're spending on your custodian salary that's not paying your rent. Um, and let's see, what do you think you're willing to give up? Let's see if you notice a difference. Start giving them these small experiments, right? Um, and so using contingency management does help. Um, but the client has to have buy-in and we do see more results that um, are showing really good outcomes for many gamblers. Um, we also in the field have to move more towards some newer scholarship and saying, why aren't we teaching more self-management to the broader community? You know, because only less than 5% of people actually come in for gambling disorders treatment. So my point is, and my colleagues in this field as advocates are saying, well, what are we doing for the other 95%? We're, we're spending so much 
um, revenue and resources and funding on treatment. And that's really important. And we have free treatment in the state of Maryland. So that's the good news is that in the state of Maryland, there's free treatment. You don't have to even use your own resources through the Center of Excellence. All you have to do is call the 1-800 helpline number and they will get you connected to free treatment on demand and make a warm transfer. For um, If you are a family member, the Maryland Coalition of Families is available. They have a gambling family coordinator, which will help support the family member or friend or affected other. So my, my message here is as clinicians and people who are preventionists, we've got to do more to offer wellness before people develop the problem, okay? Because guess what? Only 5% or less are coming in. And we know in culture communities, it's even less. It may be less than 1% of African descent that are, are actually seeking treatment. And so what does that mean? That means we've got to take it to the streets. We've got to do more Facebook lives. We've got to do more um, education for free, offering them these 10 minute commercials 15 minute sound bites, whatever we've got to do at the grassroots level and then getting them linked to the calls for help, okay? Maybe when we do that, like the ambassadors program, we're going to see more people getting connected. My scholar colleague in Nova Scotia, Dr. Wanda Bernard, she developed a great um, program for the Black Social Workers of Nova Scotia the Black Social Workers of Nova Scotia, guess what they did? They did table talks in the community. They just got uh, connected to people who were willing to open their homes to their friends and they provided, Dr. Bernard as a social worker, went into the home. Now notice with COVID, that would be not something we could do, but maybe we could set up these virtual um, table talks with people can host. We host book clubs, we host um, uh, card parties, we have family reunions, we're hosting COVID technology games for families. We could host these table talks to help people problem solve in their families. Thank you, Dr. Haskin. You're welcome. And then these are just some, um, you know, you, you can take a look at some uh, opportunities um, that books and resources for your, uh, your resources that you can use. I'm just flipping through it freely. This is a great book resource um, for practitioners with racial trauma um, and bibliotherapy. Many of you are familiar with these, but I'm including a lot of these here. And this is a new, a new one also for people who are sexual abuse survivors. We have a high incidence of sexual abuse survivors who gamble, <clears throat> also gamble. That so was thank one you. of the other questions as well um, about mm -hmm. the comorbidity of um, alcohol substance abuse with the gambling. Yes. And what differences might there be in this area with other communities? So mm -hmm. if um, we're done the presentation, yeah. we will send out the slides. If you yes. can hang on, Dr. Haskins will probably take uh, absolutely. a minute to answer that um, absolutely. question as well. And I have and my contact you, information here putting the links in the chat. That's very helpful. Kristen thank Beal you. was on it. She was putting all, all right. Thank you, Kristen. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. And thanks to everybody. And I see Heather Exman is on here. Thank you, Heather, for yes, the you, partnership. Heather, for joining us. Yes. So Robert, just hold on one second. Dr. Haskins will answer. Okay. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Joining. Thank you. Thank you, Nia. Thank you, everybody. Hi guys. Hey Heather, how are you? Good. That'd be a great job. Right. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you. Great job. Good to see you. And thank you for Roxana and Nia. You all have to call me Debbie. I'm not big on titles, honestly. Okay. I'm just a regular, <laughs> I'm just a regular sister just breathing through life, just like you and everybody. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I included my, I'll send you the slides right after. So if anyone wants to email me um, okay. and they have questions, I'm happy to, to help them. If anybody is still on the call, I'm at, yes, uh, we still I'll have 34, around. so they must want to hear. Okay. Their so go okay. 
Yeah, so there's a high, the, the largest comorbidity group actually is substance abuse. We have the highest comorbidity with substance abuse. So no surprise, when people are self-medicating through alcohol, they're, they're also engaging in other self-medications, opiates, um, also other risky behaviors, sex, sex addiction also. Um, the other ones that are high is depression and anxiety, but also PTSD. And we also have a high comorbidity with ADHD. So we see research that shows African descent persons who have high impulsivity and probably because there may be some ADHD hyperactivity there, <clears throat> but if they're impulsive and, and without even ADHD, they are impulsive in their behavior, they're more inclined to develop high risk gambling behaviors. So we also see a high risk with adverse childhood experiences. We see a lot of gamblers who have adverse childhood experiences and trauma. And so those are the ones that you're going to commonly see. So if you're already seeing people with these comorbidities, it's a good idea to start asking them, do they gamble? What do they do for fun? Don't even ask them, do they gamble? Ask them, what do you do for fun? What are you doing to help take your mind off of things? Ask it, ask it in kind of normal conversation ways. And then you'll get to, you'll start to integrate some of the gambling information. You'll probably be surprised. Um, and the Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling has a great video link that you can get access to called the comorbidity um, above um, opiates and comorbidity in the African uh, American community. And it's a very short, I think it's like 35 minutes and you'll see African American men who have open and honest conversations about their <clears throat> substance use and opiate use and gambling addiction. Okay, uh, and, and so that's a really good one that the Center of Excellence can share with you. And you can use that in your psychoeducation as well. So you or Heather may be able to answer this mm -hmm. last question. What resources are available to help gamblers um, with financial concerns from, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot, of, a, a lot of the residual of them getting out of Yes. So a couple of things. And then Heather, feel free to chime in, of course, several things. We have the voluntary exclusion program in Maryland, um, as well as other jurisdictions. And it's a legal process that you can actually exclude yourself from playing the lottery and the, um, and the casinos. And, but once you sign that legal document, then it means that you have committed a misdemeanor if you then gamble. Now, the good news is in Maryland, if someone violates, and guess what? Since COVID, we have more people violating um, because people are down and out. Um, they're isolated. They're, they're stressed. They're sad. They're depressed. They've lost a lot of loved ones. And so, um, and so the good news is that if they have to go before the judge again, that they're not going to prison. They are going to provide more recommendations and requirements for treatment. Um, and required a mandatory more increase in attendance in GA, uh, in GA and have a sponsor. That's one thing. The other thing is this is where why treatment really is important. Because guess what? If you enter treatment, your treatment provider is your advocate. If you all are interested and you want to go through the clinical training, I encourage you because then you can qualify to be a treatment provider for the treatment um, free treatment through the BHA Behavioral Health Administration and the Center of Excellence, um, you know, funding. Okay, and there's a clinical manager um, that will, uh, I don't know, I don't remember Heather the person's name, but if you can talk about that. In a minute, I always wanna say other thing too is Gamblers Anonymous, uh, Gammonon for the family members, the Maryland Coalition of Families, all of these peer recovery supports can help you. The good news about GA is when you go into a Gamblers Anonymous, they provide someone who's in good recovery that will sit down with you and help you with a pressure relief process to help you sort of rebuild, okay? Um, and, and so they will help you write letters to your creditors. They will talk to you. And this is also when you go and work with the treatment provider, help you move the finances to someone else who's gonna manage your finances. 
Now, and think about it. Most people are not going to be happy about that. People of color and particularly African descent people are not going to be thrilled about having someone else manage your money, particularly if you are a, a black woman or a black man, particularly. It, it probably you're going to see issues culturally with that. But the good news is when you explain to them that it's not going to be forever, it's what is needed to stop the bleeding. Because when you are in an ICU unit, what do they do? They do multi-system intervention. They're going to put on the oxygen mask to help you breathe. They're going to test your blood sugar to make sure you're getting the needed. They're going to make sure your kidneys are functioning. They're going to also give you the medication to help manage your hypertension. They're going to give you a multi-pronged approach to help you breathe better. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a recovery-oriented system of care to help you breathe better, to help you breathe better. And then as you're breathing better, we can start to slowly take off the different levels of intervention so that you're not always having to keep on all of this 100%. So definitely feel free to reach out. The, I also want to say that for all the clinicians that the Center of Excellence provides monthly clinical consultation so that when you're working with your client, you're not alone. You have a advanced clinician leader and supervisor like Anthony Parenti or Dr. Rugel um, and others who are supervising your work and giving you feedback on how to do the treatment planning and support your client. Thank you. Debbie. You're welcome. Oh, that's so hard to say. I, 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 I feel bad not saying doctor. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, no worry. <laughs> But thank you all for um, joining us today. And I'm glad that you raised that about getting the training um, through Behavioral Health System mm -hmm. Baltimore and prob at the Center for um, Problem Gambling, because yeah. that's a great resource and another mm -hmm. tool to have in your pocket as a um, provider. So yeah. we will compile all of the resources that Kristen, okay. Heather, and mm -hmm. Debbie had put in the chat. Okay. Um, and send out the video link. Um, and the CEUs is going to be done through the center. So that um, that's why we wanted to make sure that everyone had completed the survey. So okay. I'll send that information to them and then they will um, get in contact with me or send okay. the certificates directly to everyone. So All right. Thank Sounds you for good. joining us. You're today. welcome. All Have right, take care rest of your day, and everyone. feel free to free reach out if you need more help. Thanks. See you, Heather. Okay. Thank you, Nia. Thank you, Roxana. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.